everyone. We will get started in just a moment. Give people another minute or two to trickle in. All right, um, let's get started. So welcome everybody to archive and IT coordination and communication. Um, if you would like, you can put your uh, name and your institution in the chat um, and we can see who all is with us here today. Um, I'm Jamie Patrick Burns. I'm the digital archivist at the State Archives of North Carolina and I will be uh, moderating our webinar today. Um, before we begin, I just have a few quick announcements. Um, I'd like to um, note that our webinar series is on a summer break, um, but we've got some good things planned for the fall. Um, so enjoy your summers, whatever it holds, and uh, stay tuned for uh, future webinars in the fall. Um, in the meantime, we have the um, COSA Resource Center on our website. Um, which has all kinds of documents and templates, um, informational resources on all things electronic records um, that uh, COSA members have submitted over time. So you can feel free to check that out as well as the YouTube channel, um, which has recordings of past Siri webinars and uh, videos on special topics like metadata and email preservation and many other things. So. Um, if you are missing Siri over the summer, please go check those out. Um, and there are a number of conferences, you know, coming up, Society of American Archivists in August, um, the COSA and Best Practices Exchange um, joint meeting is in September, um, NDSA Digital Preservation is in October, so maybe some of us will cross paths at, at one of those conferences. Um, and we'd like to acknowledge our uh, 2022 sponsor, Preserva Cut. Um, and now we're going to introduce our illustrious speakers for today. So um, Kathy Popovich is um, an archival program administrator at the Illinois State Archives. She currently oversees the operations and publications sections of the State Archives and serves as the Illinois State Historical Records Advisory Board's Deputy Coordinator. She's a member of several professional organizations and serves on the Board of Directors of the Illinois State Historical Society. She has a bachelor's degree in history from Millican University and a master's degree in library and information science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with a certificate in special collections. Um, Alex Dixon is the senior conservator at the Illinois State Archives. He oversees the conservation lab, which focuses on the physical integrity, environmental effects, and storage conditions of historic documents and records. He also provides conservation best practices to state agencies and public organizations through instructional seminars and outreach programs. Alex graduated from the University of Illinois Springfield with a master's in public history and has worked in the Springfield, Illinois history community since 2012. In addition to his historical program service, he helps to develop the textile conservation department for Civil War battle flags at the Illinois State Military Museum before joining the Illinois State Archives as conservator. So those are our Illinois representatives. And um, from Pennsylvania, Suzanne Stasulitis has over 10 years of experience in archives and records management and has worked for the Pennsylvania State Archives for the past nine years. In addition to assisting with the electronic records management system, digital archives and digital records center planning, migration and technology duties, she's worked on the preservation of digital accessions that seem to be coming into the archives increasingly frequently. Most recently, she stepped into a position as the head of digital outreach. She holds two bachelor's degrees and a master of arts, 
maintains a Society of American Archivists Digital Archives Specialist Certification, has completed coursework through the Association for Information and Image Management, and attended the Digital Power Institute. She is a huge proponent of continuing education and takes uh, free classes through Coursera, W3 Schools, and the like on topics ranging from Python to user experience design. And last but certainly not least, Bill Ward has been working in many aspects of IT for close to 30 years, mostly as a liaison between the business and IT. Bill started with the Commonwealth in 2008 as a business analyst with the Department of Human Services and working his way up to being a business relationship manager with the Office of Administration's General Government Delivery Center. As a business relationship manager, Bill works strategically with the leadership at PHMC on a slew of different IT project needs to preserve Pennsylvania's history and make that history available for its citizens. So we are excited to hear from these folks today. Um, and just before I turn it over, um, we will hold questions until the end, but please feel free to enter questions into the chat as they come up. So um, without further ado, I am going to stop sharing and hand it over. We go. Thank you, Jamie. Um, and thank you, Siri and COSA for having us here today. Um, Alex and I are going to talk today a little bit about how we work with our IT department at the Illinois State Archives. Uh, and more specifically, we're going to talk about a grant, po grant projects that we recently completed. Uh, and again, how we were able to work together with our IT department on that project. So first, Alex is going to tell you a little bit about IT coordination in general at the State Archives. Yeah, so uh, our IT department is a fairly standard department. Uh, they're going to handle everything from computer upgrades to server maintenance. Um, one thing with Illinois Archives is that we're under the Department of Secretary of State. And so our ID department is responsible from everything from driver facilities, uh, issuing driver's licenses to the state library, the state archives. Um, so it's a pretty broad range of different departments that they have to be responsible for. Uh, and so because of that, uh, some of our, our policies that they've put in place are pretty broad. Uh, and so when we get into how we handle our grant project, uh, some of the issues that came up are going to be issues because of how broad of a, a type of department that they have to cover. Um, one thing that they've done to help kind of improve that is they created what's called an IT liaison, and every department under Secretary of State is going to have a minimum of uh, one or two, up to as many as they would like, and what it gives IT is a central contact for each individual department, uh, and it's supposed to help, uh, you know, their communication dealing with these different areas because they may not necessarily know the best ideas or the best way to solve the issues as a department would need. And so the liaison is there to kind of be that in-between contact uh, and to hopefully streamline any sort of solutions that they can put out to the different areas. Uh, and so that's what my position here, uh, along with conservation is I'm one of our IT liaisons. And so that put us as a, or put me in part of uh, dealing with our grant project that we were able to complete. Um, so a little bit about that project. We have a large collection of photo negatives taken by uh, the longtime state photographer, uh, Doc Helm. So he was a state photographer for over 50 years. Um, the collection includes, you know, photos of politicians, celebrities, um, different events throughout the state. Um, as well as the day-to-day -day operations of state government. So it's a, it's a really important and great collection and we, we really wanted to um, make that more accessible. Um, so we estimated that we had about 21,000 four by five photo negatives and about 9,000 35 millimeter negatives. Um, so in 2019, we applied for and received a grant from the NHPRC 
uh, for a little over $60,000 to digitize the four by five negatives. Um, as you can see, we were way off in our estimates. Um, so in total, we ended up with, we got about 22,000 photos online. We scanned over 31,000 and we have over 45,000 refolder with basic metadata. So, um, and at the bottom of the slide, there is a link to the collection if you're interested. So um, for your viewing pleasure, we've, all of the photos in our slides are from this collection. So they have nothing to do with the slide, but we just like the photos. So we had to share them. Um, so that's a basic rundown of our grant project. Um, so before applying for the grant, uh, we had a couple of meetings. First, we met with the State Library, who they run the Illinois Digital Archives, where we put the, uh, the photos online. Um, so we met with them and their IT people just to make sure that they could handle a collection of this size. Uh, we talked through a workflow that we could propose in our grant. Um, we sent them some metadata examples just to make sure we were um, we were entering things appropriately, getting the appropriate kind of metadata that they needed for their system, um, and you know, uh, kind of coordinate that before we even applied. Um, and then we also met with the then director of Do It, um, our IT department, to discuss our needs. So we went over the kind of equipment we would be asking for. So computer monitors, scanner, backup hard drives. Um, we also talked about server space uh, since the master scans uh, would be living on a server for the foreseeable future. Um, and that dis the discussions with them were, were really helpful. They suggested some equipment that we could, um, that we could look into getting. Um, they gave us specs for that. Um, we also um, were able to get some language from them on how our servers are maintained to include that in our grant application to, to really bolster you know, the sustainability issue of, of this project. Um, and you know, we, were, we were assured that we, we would have the server space if and when we received the grant. Um, so again, that was in spring of 2019. Um, and then as grants go, you know, I think we received word in May of 2020. Um, so, you know, a, a good time gap there um, that between actually receiving the grant. So as the grant started, uh, we needed to have our meetings to make sure everything was on the same page. Uh, and right off the bat, one of the big things that we had to take account was that the director of Do It had changed. Uh, and with that was a lack of um, passing off information like covering our servers um, and now having to deal with an entire new group of leadership in order so they were, uh, could be made aware of what this grant was and what they were going to need to do to support us. Um, so the biggest of that was in a meeting where everything was pretty much ready to go. Um, we mentioned how the server space needed to be opened up and the new director and some of the higher up staff were unaware of the previous commitments made. And so they upset is too strong of a word, but they mentioned that had they known that this was going to be part of a grant, they would have said that a allotment of money for server space would have been included, um, that they would be able to handle it, but it was going to cause a little bit of a strain for them uh, in where they were going to be able to pull the server space from, where they were going to be able to add more servers to house these records. Um, and that led into, as the project continued, uh, server space ran out pretty quickly. You know, we're housing thousands of TIFF files. And so this was kind of a double, uh, you know, two different paths we had to go about. One of which was dealing with IT and getting more server space allocated for us, uh, which after three, four weeks maybe of going back and forth on, you know, different options and plans, we came up with a method that uh, they would allocate us server space in 100 gigabyte chunks. Uh, and so that would mean that they didn't need to find a couple of terabytes all at once. And it allowed 
our progress to continue. So we didn't have people who were scanning, just sitting there twiddling their thumbs. Uh, but it, then uh, it was an easier way for IT to physically handle it because they could do it in the smaller chunks. Uh, but part of that on our side, what it allowed us to do uh, as a, as a you know, department under SOS was we had servers and files on those servers for 10, 15 years, uh, many of which were duplicates, many of which were redundant, many of which were just personal files that people would put on uh, when they were still employed here and they'd been gone from the agency for years. And so as, a, as an agency, we went through and we cleaned up all of our servers. Um, and we're talking one department alone probably freed up three or four gigabytes worth of space. Uh, Kathy's department freed up over five. Uh, I found files that were from the former uh, people in the conservator that were pictures that we were able to get rid of. Um, so we saved, you know, as as small as it sounds, 10 or 11 gigabytes worth of space, but when every picture, you know, requires a space and we're suffering to get more, that was a huge help for us. Um, and so that was something that, you know, on our end, we should have done probably before the project started to help out IT a little bit. Um, uh, but then with IT, they were able to work with us to get a solution, a solution in place uh, to provide the space that we needed. Uh, so once we got that all figured out, uh, we were actually physically, you know, able to hire our contractual employees that were going to be working on the grant. Uh, and part of that was then again working with IT to get employee profiles set up. Um, and because we were doing digitization, we needed to get all the contractuals, uh, various accounts set up for the scanner for Adobe Photoshop. Uh, and that brought up its own issues in that the scanner software was easily applied to every profile but IT had changed our Adobe licensing the year before, and we were no longer using the older version, which was just a flat install and you didn't have to have a login. Uh, we went to the new monthly subscription base, which meant we had to have actual accounts set aside for each contractual. And IT um, probably underestimated the amount that they needed because they quickly ran out. And so for a while we had uh, three different employees using one account, which meant that if they ever had any sort of password issues or login issues or anything, uh, they had to make sure that that employee was in that day so that their cell phone could be used as the you know, password recovery. Um, and so it's something that you know, we probably could have communicated a little bit better with how many accounts we were going to need, uh, but IT also could have um, you know, properly prepared for it and had the proper amount of accounts that they were going to need um, or been able to quickly acquire more as different departments needed them. Um, and so that took a couple of weeks to get everything up and running. Uh, we were able to start the scans, but the editing of those scans you know, were delayed a little bit. Uh, and then the last thing that we dealt with is in the middle of all of this, our IT department had gone into a pretty massive overhaul and modernization of pretty much everything from computer equipment uh, to security. And one of those changes was USB access was completely removed from every computer. Uh, they had done an internal audit where they dropped some flash drives that didn't have anything of actual importance on it, but they wanted to see if employees were plugging them in. Uh, and they found that a couple of them had been plugged into other computers in the network and a couple of the hard or the flash drives just disappeared. And so uh, file security became a really big deal. And as part of our grant, we had uh, a requirement to have two external hard drives set aside for offsite storage and backup of all of these files that were suddenly unable to be accessed because we had lost USB use. And it took probably three weeks maybe of meetings and trainings and uh, having to fill out certifications and getting our director approval to reopen up USB access for these, um, or for the people that were actually working on the grant. And so that was something that uh, was just, it was a curveball that we weren't expecting. And so it just slowed, you know, a little bit of the project down 
um, scans were able to continue on, but our backups then, you know, for those two or three weeks were no longer up to date. Uh, and we did have some server issues in the middle of there where their backup copies got corrupted. And so they had to, you know, go to an older backup, which prevented some of the um, files that we had scanned to stay on the server. Um, so it was a little scary there for a little bit, but we were able to get through uh, and, you know, IT was great to work with, just took us a little longer than I think both sides would have liked, um, but we did get everything solved that we needed to. And that, you know, then got us to where we were able to transfer them to their permanent home now. Um, the last thing that we worked on with um, IT was um, was really with the State Library because they have their own IT person there. Um, and really, this was the easiest part of the project for us. Um, we sent, basically, we sent the Excel spreadsheets with our metadata and chunks. Um, we got permissions for their IT person to access the shared drive area on our server uh, where the photos lived. Um, so they did all the conversions. Um, they converted the images from TIFFs to JPEGs for us, which was nice. Um, and then they were able to upload everything in about batches of about 4,000. So um, again, working with that small part of their IT department was, um, was really simple for us. Um, and it, it, was a, it was kind of a good way to, to finish out the project, I think. Uh, so kind of our takeaways from this um, and what we could, as a department could have done better um, and what we would have liked a little bit more from do it. Um, so I think the biggest and I think this is probably the most obvious thing is that, you know, communication is really essential um, and to write things down so that everyone can reference what was discussed. So it was a pretty big time gap between us actually preparing the application and then starting the project. Um, so having something to look back at, um, especially for do it would have been really beneficial, especially since, um, there was quite a bit of staff turnover, um, with them. And I think if we were to do this over again, or in the future, moving forward, um, you know, having a sit down or, you know, nowadays a, a virtual sit down, um, with everyone laying out everything before the grant even began um, to revisit what we had discussed, um, you know, do, do it can let us know some things that are, are coming down in the pipeline for them. Um, but uh, again, just a, a, re a, a regrouping to have everyone on the same page because it did take us a while to finally say, okay, we need to get people in the room. We need everybody on the call so we can kind of plan this out. Um, because we clearly weren't communicating in a way that was helpful to them um, so that, uh, you know, it, it took us a while to get to get everyone on the same page. Yeah, and again, you know, being able to have um, a meeting with IT or uh, just regular updates to have a better idea that certain things are going to be coming, uh, you know, had we known that the USB removal or the USB access was going to be removed, we could have found a different way to have our backups, or we could have found a way to, you know, preemptively exclude a computer uh, that maybe had a, you know, increased security on it that would allow us to still make our backups. Um, and there are, you know, there are some meetings that we have between the liaisons with IT, uh, but those are pretty broad spectrum. They're not going to be more detailed of what you know is going to be of interest to the archives as a whole it's more of this is a you know as an sos entity or secretary of state entity this is what you know we may be doing uh, and then as beneficial as the liaison program is for uh, for do it it would be great for the individual departments to have a similar contact person within it uh, they have their basic support staff that you can call, you know, or our basic number and, and get a hold of them. Uh, but if I had one person that I could get a hold of and say, hey, we're having issues with servers and this particular, you know, individual issue, who is the best person that I need to contact? Because um, as it was, I would call the person who I would think they would say, well, that's not really my department. That's this is who you need to talk to. And I would talk to them and they'd say, yeah, but it's 
this particular person in this department that you need to talk to. And now I've you know, talked to three or four people before I can get to the person who I actually need. Um, and so it would just be, it'd be nice to have that direct link to one person who you know, we could build a rapport with uh, as we move on with different issues and projects and all that type of stuff. So um, with that, that's our presentation of you know, the Illinois State Archives working with uh, our IT department for this particular grant. Uh, I'd like to thank Jamie and Kosa and Siri uh, for allowing us to talk about uh, what we kind of got to deal with. So thank you. I think we'll just go right into uh, myself, Suzanne Stashelitis, and Bill Ward's presentation. Uh, I just want to apologize up front if there's any traffic outside. Uh, I do apologize for that. But um, yeah, thank you for joining us and, and thank you to Illinois and the presenters. Um, I'm so glad uh, so to just share my slides. Sorry about that. I'm so glad that I could help Josh Hackle uh, organize this webinar, which was originally envisioned to be a panel. Um, I'm just not sure if I'm sharing here. Okay. Okay. Can everybody see? Bill, can you see? <laughs> gotcha. That's great. Okay, let's start this right back over. Um, I just wanted to say that I was uh, glad that I could work with Josh Hackle to organize this webinar, which was originally envisioned as a sort of panel. Um, in some ways, my presentations, I hope, I hope it achieves a similar result. Um, I'm going to be describing the IT collaboration projects that I've had some in stake. Uh, in along with Bill Ward, who showed up quite frequently at project team meetings and was very quiet for the most part uh, and listened. That is until somebody opposed single sign on. Uh, the, the quiet made everyone extremely nervous. I'll be asking Bill some questions throughout the presentation, but please hold audience questions until after we've presented. You're welcome to put them in the chat. Um, I'm hoping not to overwhelm us both, however. Um, there should be plenty of time for, for questions at the end for both both presenting teams. Um, so as I said, I'd like to introduce five collaboration projects and I'll ask Bill a few, uh, a question or two uh, following the summary of each of our collaboration projects. Um, they include our virtual machine, uh, the VM, our intake machine, uh, the Azure migration that we recently underwent, our new building project, which is everyone's favorite, and um, the digital preservation system procurement, as well as the enterprise-wide uh, enterprise ERMS project. So we'll start here with the virtual machine. Uh, so the PA State Archives, while exploring digital preservation technology, found that uh, apps and programs appeared to support our effort and facilitate our work, work process. Uh, one major problem that arose was that our central IT department required a lengthier application project process to acquire the software and they needed to download the programs as well. Uh, no one in our archives has admin access to our machines uh, and we weren't sure if we wanted to use the program. Because instructions and applications for text oriented apps are often vague, uh, we wanted to complete testing prior to impl implementation. The testing had to account, um, had to occur to verify technology and workflow compatibility. Uh, our centralized IT department set up a virtual machine, a VM for us to use to test programs. We tested file analyzer, bagger, bit curator, file renaming software, email processing software, uh, many tools and, and scenarios and workflows. Uh, the virtual machine is, is simply a platform that you can log onto your computer and acts as a clean computer to which you can download programs and run scripts that don't affect your actual hard drive. Uh, so you have admin rights. 
Uh, the testing was highly effective and resulted in the implementation of several task-oriented apps used to improve and streamline our uh, digital preservation and, and other efforts. Um, it's important to note that if we didn't have admin access, we couldn't have done all the crucial testing and the implementation for simple free programs would have been convoluted, inefficient, take up staff time. Um, but this way we were able to be granted uh, admin access to test and in some case use the tools. Um, and it was, it was a, an excellent opportunity uh, to set up a, a virtual machine for staff use. So I'd like to turn the question now to Bill. Um, why is everything so locked down? Why is admin access such a hurdle? Why do we have trouble even getting to websites that we need to use? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I'm glad to be here and thanks for the invite. Um, a, pop a popular theme you're gonna hear today is uh, security. Um, and, and it's not only just the, the security, obviously there's physical security, keeping um, folks outside of computers, but also the protection of the assets and data that we as a Commonwealth are, are stewards of. Um, so there's a, um, and I, I talk a little bit about this a little bit later on, um, it, a lot of policies in place specifically to secure our devices, all of our IT devices. Um, and so, it's, Suzanne, you, you, you mentioned admin access. If you think about admin access, you're, you're home on your home PC, you see a neat little uh, uh, program to help you manage maybe your day-to-day -day activities. Um, it's out on a website, you download it, you can load it, it's an application, it's an executable, it's on your machine, and now you can do these, um, uh, you can manage your day. The challenge with that, on a Commonwealth PC or the, the state's PC is that if we provided that level of access to the PC to be able to load an executable, to be able to change settings or devices, registries, um, it would be the wild, wild west. Uh, people would be downloading things from all over the place and we as a, an IT team would not know where they were coming from. There's a Number of different things that happen at that point. A, their security. Where are these coming from? Are these approved applications? Are they safe? Are they uh, made and developed by bad actors who may want to try to have access to your network, which makes your data, um, uh, puts your data in trouble? As well, there's, um, if everybody has their own version of a word processing software, where does the support come from? Um, so if I'm using Joe's word processor because it gives me some neat tools that word does not give me and something happens on my computer and I call the help desk and said, hey, I was using Joe's word processor and all of a sudden my machine crashed. The support can't help because they don't know what it is that is on the machine. They don't know how it's configured. So as a, um, best practice, the Commonwealth locks down everybody's machines for administrative access, except for a few folks who do who can get in there and do some things. That doesn't mean that we um, can't provide access depending on your role. So uh, um, I, I'll mention this a little bit later on, but uh, as an IT department, we try not to come across as being the department of no. Um, we want to we want to be able to serve you and, and be able to help the folks in to do their jobs, but there's gotta be a level of security and, and trust there. Um, and, and, and you also mentioned websites. It sort of goes the same way. If I can get to joeswordprocessing.com, where is that website? Do we really know where it is? Do we know what it's coming from? Do we know that as I access that website, is somebody coming through a back door and into our systems? So we have a, a firewall in place that has, it's rather large, the, the white list of websites we can go to, but we do restrict a lot of things. Obviously there's some things about safety and um, uh, public safety that we wanna not come through our networks and have folks on our networks being having access to. But at the same time, we don't want folks going to Google Docs and uploading documents or Dropbox and uploading documents. In general, those tend to be places where information executables can hide and find their way into 
a computer, therefore onto the network. Now we have asked, or we have been asked by um, uh, Suzanne's peers over at NPHMC, hey, we need, we have a business need to be able to use Dropbox with some of our uh, public customers and our, some of our public partners, can we have access to? So we're, again, we're, we have the, um, uh, the partnership to, and the business need. Sure, we can provide you access to these people, access to Dropbox so they can uh, facilitate that partnership. So um, th that's really the big thing about uh, firewalls being strict and administrative access on the machines. It's, it comes down to safety uh, of the data and the protection of the, and the security. I'm just curious, I don't need to ask you a follow-up question, sure. uh, Bill, but if there's a particular website that we need for our, our, our daily business or daily work, can we have that investigated and added to uh, the the allowable sites? Oh, without a doubt. And we do we do this every day. We do have a, um, policies in place and, and a process in place um, in which a request can come across to say, hey, I need access to Tom's website. We will then do a little bit. Of, and why do you need access? That's that's also the big thing. Why do you need access to Tom's website? Then our security team does some quick lookups. Hey, where is this website physically located? Who is managing it? And they they do a quick determination. Say we think that this is a safe website or not a safe website. And they will provide or not provide access depending on uh, those outcomes. But again, we try not to be that. Uh, department of no, you can't do that. Give us a reason. And if it's a valid business reason and we've determined that it's safe, we'll provide the access. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, I guess I'll move on here um, and talk about the intake machine. Prior to the implementation of Microsoft 365, which was a major Commonwealth initiative, our transfers required concerted and convoluted efforts to receive files from agencies. One of our tried and true security friendly methods was to transfer via an external hard drive and then just bring the art, uh, hard drive to the archives where we would download the files to our computers. Um, to increase security and virus protection and to avoid potentially corrupting files on our network, uh, we required an intake machine. Uh, to make matters worse, a new virus scanning program on all Commonwealth machines scanned files and, and immediately deleted the corrupted files. We wanted to kind of quarantine those files, figure out what they were, uh, what their file names were at the very least, and then dispose of them ourselves um, or, or triage them. Um, so IT agreed with us that our business case was strong and we reserved a laptop with uh, McAfee scan on demand uh, functionality at our office. And we still use this, this machine when we have uh, hard drive transfers that, you know, may come from a less secure origin or um, old CDs, you know, from the, from, we call it the tower, but from our archives, old CDs. Um, the collaboration was successful and we came to an agreement because we spelled out our justification and use case. We came to a consensus through dialogue and discussion. We review and evaluate the process every so often to ensure that our reasoning is still valid. Um, to continue completing tasks with the intake machine, we outlined bullets and underscored our use case that also uh, aligned with IT priorities. If the IT priorities hadn't overlapped, we might have had a completely different result. Okay, here you go, Bill. Ready for question two. What are IT's priority regulation or rules for agency per personnel? And what is the reasoning behind those priority regulations? Again, security. Um, so we have, and, and, and your, your previous slide was a prime example of, of why we put a lot of these, uh, some of these policies in place. That hard drive that you're plugging into the computer, where did it come from? It, it came from Lancaster County. Their, their archives folks, they have some stuff that they want to archive at the state archives. Great. Where did they get it? Who is the manufacturer of that, that hard drive? There are, are there, is there anything on that hard drive that does a, and this is one that my uh, security officer likes to use, does it call home to somebody um, where it calls home to potentially a bad actor? Those things we don't know about that piece of hardware that's come in. Um, 
uh, Alex over in Illinois, uh, they had a very similar challenge. Their IT folks locked down their USBs, so they could not plug in a, a USB because you don't know where it is. You don't know where it came from. You don't know what's on it. Um, so there's, there's, I, I see similar themes across many of uh, all of IT, and, and I, would, I would hope a lot of security folks across all the states um, are following those. Uh, some of the things that we try to do um, is to educate uh, the, the, the 60,000 state employees who sit down in front of a computer every day about use, what, what is responsible use of your computer, what you're allowed to do, what are you not allowed to do, changing passwords, what kind of passwords do you get? Hey, that email that looks suspicious, are you going to click on that attachment or are you going to click on that link that's sitting there? Those, that training, that yearly training we have found has been um, uh, significantly reduced the amount of phishing that has attempts that have occurred within the Commonwealth. Uh, the, our security team occasionally sends out uh, bogus phishing attempts just to try to see is the training working? And there has been, after a number of years of this training, significant reductions of those. So we're just trying to make sure that, that the data is secure um, and, and we, we're not the, the, the folks that don't want you to be able to do your work, but we still just want to be able to secure the data um, and secure you. Um, and, and, and when we get into the, the data, we're, we're talking not only just items in, in PHMC or in your, your archives, um, there's connections between those archives if push comes to shove, being able to get from the archives to a central server over to our Department of, of Health. There's a lot of PHI, PII information there, or even Department of Corrections. They can kind of find their way around the network if somebody knows what they're doing. So by, lock, by putting up those barriers up front and making it difficult for somebody to get around, um, is it, it helps. It, it, it keeps everybody safe and they're very secure. Absolutely. I have become more and more security minded. And I just wanted to say that I, I did get the Fish Finder Award this year. Um, you know, if you find the, the phishing email test, uh, you get an award and I got a nice little amount. So, um, See, it works. <laughs> when our Azure. What's nice, if, if I can go back to that, what's yeah. nice is that um, I get uh, folks just like you from across PHMC and another agency that I support, our Department of General Services, they'll email me saying, hey, Bill, is this a, a phishing attempt? And I might know, I might not know, but at times I just say, well, what is the process that you're supposed to do when you do think it's a phishing attempt? And so there are processes and, and part of that training. So my response is already always do what you have to do to make, because I don't know. And, um, and it, it, it's, it's great that people are now identifying the potential um, phishing and, and spam alerts that, that they have come across their desk. Absolutely. When our RT, uh, what, sorry, when our Azure migration didn't go quite as planned, um, our central IT offered several solutions, but none quite resolved our issue. So metadata was available in Azure, was not available in Azure, and we were left without crucial metadata like created date, modified date, and other Windows metadata. Taking a cue from the COSA Siri Move It project, uh, we downloaded a script from the COSA website and it inventoried all the metadata in a certain file set. And this was a fantastic way to retain the metadata should we need it in the future. Our archivists don't have admin access, but we were able to work with an expert developer to run the script. The developer saw additional areas to improve the script and meet our particular business needs. We were able to execute the script and create a comprehensive list of metadata for future use or if we wanted to write the, the metadata back to um, Azure. If in this instance, uh, a subject matter expert, which we call SME, is a, the archivist and was myself and a SME developer, uh, to, though thoroughly tasked already, we're able to work together to achieve a beneficial result. At times when a cohort of professional peers work together, results can be achieved quickly and with positive result. For this project, we were able to peel back a few layers of bureaucracy and expedite the problem understanding re requirements and solution. 
Peer-to-peer -peer com communication is often easier than jumping through hoops with senior management. However, disparate per professional staff may still misconstrue language or fall back on language uh, that is kind of unique or specialized in their discipline. So I guess uh, my question to you, Bill, in regards to this project is that there are significant language barriers in terms of IT speak and ingrained verbiage used by archivists. Sometimes when we call, you know, make calls with Microsoft, there's, there's definitely that barrier. Uh, what makes archivists different or unique when trying to relate our work processes and tasks and, and trying to find common ground? There, when it comes to, to relating your work procedures and trying to find that common ground, um, there is really nothing that is unique between archivists and an HVAC mechanic and a, uh, a, um, a, a somebody who produces videos for the governor's office. We each have our own technical speaks. We each have our own um, uh, acronyms, SOS. When I heard SOS uh, uh, mentioned earlier, I'm like, what's that? Well, it's the Secretary of State. Well, over here in Pennsylvania, we call, at least where I'm, but when we talk about it, it's sex state. So there's, there's differences in, in speak. Um, and when I was, uh, shortly after I got the invite for this, I um, had a, one of uh, Suzanne's peers reached out to me and said, hey, you know what, we want to reach, we want to log into the University of Colorado's um, uh, planetarium department and download a program which we would like to use for our educational systems. So I was like, you know, I don't think it's a bad idea. Let me run it up to my security guy. So I write my security guy and said, hey, the PHMC, the Pennsylvania Historic Museum Commission, their planetarium folks, they want to download a program to, to help with their educational stuff. Well, he comes back and he says, there's absolutely, what is the use case? What are the licensing? Where did these programs come from? Who developed the programs? He was, his mindset was directly on, it's an executable. I'm downloading a program to run on my computer. It's going to make a change to the computer um, to do something. And so he was, he was concerned that it was a, um, that this program could impact the security of the, the network. My question to him was, no, I just want to know if it's okay for us to FTP into their site to download a WAV file, a movie file, because that movie file will then get displayed on the, the, the roof of the planetarium. So we kind of had a laugh at that because we were going back and forth, oh, are they going to play Wolfenstein, um, a computer game from the 1980s up on the big screen? Have It, it, was, it was just a, a way of our... Um, uh, our terminology and where we are coming from. So archivists really are no different than anybody else um, when it comes to trying their, uh, to describe what their needs are and what their requirements are. Um, and, and so the, the, the way that I try to, to work with um, PHMC and with uh, DGS is I try to ingrain myself into their systems as much as possible. I would like to spend more time with each of my agencies um, in each of the departments to really learn and get into the weeds. But I, I don't have that opportunity. I'm a, I'm a person of one. Um, so when, when working with the, the, the new systems that are coming online, that's what I try to do is I try to ingrain myself, sit in the back and just listen. So I know what's going to be happening and what's, what the needs and requirements are. And then when something comes up that I know is going to impact policy, impact security, for example, single sign-on, then I get to raise my hand and, and put my two cents in. Um, so that, that's what I do um, to try to, to learn the lingo, learn the language barrier. Um, but um, there really is no difference between archivists and like I said, HVAC mechanics who I have to kind of understand their lingo as well at times. Yeah. Um, and you, just so you know, um, you know I, I think our most successful projects were the ones where the the person doing the, the business, doing the work, um, came to IT with a clearly thought out, you know, request that addresses security and, you know, uh, I, you know, uses IT speak so everyone can, you know, find a common, a common uh, ground to, to talk about something. So, yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, the, the requests have to be well thought out. So, um, for sure. um, okay, so, the PA State Archives has completed significant work on uh, our new building. 
Archivists have seen the current building undergo water damage following floods and even common or more severe storms. The leaks have caused problems on several floors. Um, luckily, nothing has affected uh, the temperature controlled and, and renovated uh, floor that holds the PA charter, but records have gotten wet. On the bright side, our disaster management skills are above par. Um, humidifiers spot the building and we have seen work areas affected as well. Um, at times hallways are lined with buckets and suspicious rodents uh, can enter near, near windows. Ants uh, often become persistent when, when archivist manners lapse. We have a creaky elevator that has been known to trap archivists several times in the course of a career. Um, while there's certainly impetus for a new bu building, even the beginning steps of finding the location have taken years. Some uh, might include the decades of planning at separate locations, only to see the plans abandoned with a new administration. Uh, the success of finding a location outside of the flood zone, appeasing all involved parties, and cooperating with multiple state agencies has been a giant leap for PAs, archivists, and stakeholders. The new planned building is almost done. It holds a state-of-the-art self-service reference area, high-density shelving, and fiber optic cable with for alt optimal speed and delivery. Um, I'd like to ask another question here. Um, uh, to Bill, who has acted as the business relationship manager, um, what are what are information technologies absolute musts for the new building? What major checkboxes was IT keen to fill for the construction of the new archives building? One of the biggest things, and and uh, other than um, obviously the network connectivity, security, um, is the computers that we have in the the reference room in the search room. Um, for everybody on the call, in general. Um, the idea is that somebody can come off the street and they can do a lookup of uh, the Pennsylvania archives, um, either whether it's uh, birth records, um, deeds, going back to the Civil War, um, and so on and so forth. And so the, these are public machines, these are public computers. So we needed to be able to ensure that we're locking them, when I say lock them down, we, to harden them so that they are, um, uh, A, they don't get beat up because the public is coming in, they're using them, and B, um, that we're not, they're not introducing um, uh, a, a, I see a great picture that I like, I'm going to put in a, a USB drive and I'm going to download the picture. So we have to put some security into place to keep that, uh, to make sure that that is done uh, securely and safely. Um, so we came up with a number of ideas. Uh, we presented them to uh, the folks who were building the building and they looked at us and they said, no, no, we want to make it a, uh, an easy experience to be able to do something like this, not have to go through hoops, not jump through hoops and ask people to do sort of, it, there was a lot of, it, it wasn't, we weren't looking at it at, from the citizen's point of view as it being easy and a simple task. So we went back and forth and we're um, purchasing specific computers um, that are allow us both the security and the accessibility to our archives. But then there's one more piece to that. Um, the, the requirement is on those same machines, I should be able to, not only should I be able to research archives and get and go through our network to be able to, um, to download these pictures and do this research, I should also be able to go out onto the internet and be able to do other research on the World Wide Web. So there's a security piece right in the middle that's saying, um, and, and this kind of has my security guy sitting on edge a little bit, how do we provide a, a, a path to allow for the research and into our network to be able to do those things that the, the citizen has a, an opportunity to do with regards to the archives, but also be able to go out onto the internet and do things uh, across the internet. Um, so that that was is is still a developing um, a solution to try to allow that to happen, and uh, we think we have something in place. Um, it, and the, the folks who are putting that in, in place are a lot smarter than I. But I just know that they they are working together, they're collaboratively working behind the scenes to make that happen, so that we can have this requirement. Um, uh, made available so that the citizens can do both items. Um, so that was one of our biggest check blocks. Um, other than that, redundant, redundant um, network through fiber optics, um, being able to 
move data quickly from point A to point B from scanning, especially when you have large Civil War maps and get that, that data stored. Um, today we have 80 ter at least 80 terabytes of data up in the Azure cloud, being able to access that quickly. Um, so we're, we're working with new technologies and, and updated technologies to make that, that happen. So it's, um, uh, um, th those are some of the bigger items that, that we are running into with the new building. It's gonna be a beautiful building. Okay. Yeah, this is so exciting. Um, yeah, and, and I just wanted to add that ultimately, you know, the Commonwealth uh, are our ultimate clients, I believe. So the, the public, uh, at least archives, and, and, and I know, you know, you have to balance every everything, but uh, it's, I think that's a wonderful plan uh, for the search from computers. So, yay. The Digital Archives and Digital Records Center, what we call the DADRIC request for proposal, uh, sometimes called the RFP process requires an IT liaison to ensure Commonwealth IT directives are being adhered to in the midst of all the archival wants and needs. The process was a several year journey of its own. It necessitated drawn out conversations about requirements and evaluation of business needs because the project would require significant funds and the impact it would have on the archives in the Commonwealth, not to exclude researchers and stakeholders. Evaluation had to be elevated, fair, structured, and meet the directives of the Commonwealth as a whole. You can view the Siri webinar about the PA State Archives procurement journey in a recorded webinar from last year. In a very structured RFP with scoring and demos, the PA team made sure they were choosing the best product. The RFP process was applied to the DADRIC, as well as the ERMS project, which we may get to in a minute here. Um, Still, archives had completed significant testing and had a stronghold on what requirements were more crucial than others. Why, Bill, is the RFP process so strict and rigid? Why, what is the single most thing that archives wants that IT won't budge on and why? And you may say security. <laughs> and and there, there are some security pieces to that. Um, some of the things that we were not, that, so the RFP process, uh, as, as was described here, is just a, um, uh, a process to make the purchasing of and, and of of the product fair and open to uh, anybody who can uh, participate. Um, so the um, so there's a list of requirements. Here's what we need in in our digital archives. Um, and so in there, there's also what we call the IT teams IT terms and conditions, and also our IT policies. Many of those policies have to do with security. Um, and things that we will not budge on. Is the data being stored in the continental United States? Um, who has access to that data? Who can provide support? Is the person who's providing support located in the Commonwealth unit of the United States? Um, these are all just for security pieces to keep our, our data safe. Um, if there's a data breach, who's, on, who's taking the ownership of that data breach? And there's also, I mentioned a little bit earlier, single sign-on. We want to have single sign-on into these so that, A, we know who, is, um, who has access to the, um, uh, the data, but at the same time, who has, uh, if somebody was to leave the Commonwealth in not so friendly terms, that they don't have access to be able to get back into that data because a lot of this data is on the cloud and we need to be able to secure that. Um, and, and so those are really the big things that we wouldn't budge on is where is the data stored and um, where is the support coming from? Um, and if those were in the continent of the United States, because one of our vendors that, that did bid on it was not, um, and I believe they're making concessions to try to, to meet those requirements, um, that those were some requirements that we weren't going to budge on. Okay. Um, Jamie, do we have time for one more or would you rather go to questions? Um, good question. <laughs> you know, if, if folks want to stay on a little bit longer, um, past three, I, I think that's totally fine. Um, do you want to? Yeah, this, this one will take a, a, a couple minutes here and then, and then Bill can just answer a final question. And if it goes a little long, uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate everyone's time. Um, When a vendor stated they would no longer support a product, the Commonwealth found itself in a predicament. 
The product only runs on Microsoft Explorer and IE was ending support in less than a year. So staff and management found themselves stuck for a solution. With less than a year to procure a new solution, the archives in cooperation with OAIT looked to find an enterprise-wide solution to support agency records management needs. Similar to the DADRIC procurement journey, the new ARMS RFP and implementation required a significant amount of coordination and communication. From RFP to implementation, our IT chaperone ensured that we were finding the best product not only for the archives and state records center, but also for the Commonwealth. One thing IT would not budge on was single sign-on. Without this feature, we could not move forward. Some agencies aren't equipped for single sign-on, making uh, requirements hurdles even more of a challenge. Our vendor uh, was able to meet our requests and the implementation is underway. It makes sense that IT has a large stake in, in enterprise-wide projects because um, they move between agencies and, and they see the big picture uh, that, that we as a small agency um, do not see in, in, in a crucial and critical light. So, okay, here's the last question, Bill. Uh, what goes, this is a tough one. <laughs> what goes into planning an enterprise solution in IT's mind? And, and this is a, a, a long answer to a quick question. Um, it, it, it comes down at least from our, uh, from our CIO, the, um, the Commonwealth CIO, it's all about governance. What is, what is the strategic goal, not only for the Commonwealth, but also for PHMC? Um, and then if it's a, if it's a piece of software, it, it, there's a lot of loops that have to, there are a lot of hoops that get jumped through before we get to a point where, is there somebody already having it? Do we already need, um, is this available? Would this be available for other people to use? Um, uh, is it, um, who's going to manage it? Who's going to troubleshoot it? Who where is the support coming from? Um, who's paying for it? So th that, those governance pieces, um, uh, really a guide in the strategic uh, needs of each of the agencies and as well as the Commonwealth to make sure that we are moving forward in a, uh, in a like direction to ensure that um, the, 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 the citizen is well is best protected. And that, that I was just trying to keep that quick because I know we're low short on time. So um, I hope that answered that question. Yeah, I just get, wanted to give you a second here too, Bill, to, to graciously thank you for all your words of wisdom. And um, if you wanted to, to you know, uh, underscore anything, um, I handed yeah. over. To you. Yeah, I, I just I had a couple bullets here. Um, uh, when when speaking to IT, um, I, I think just like everybody else, our feathers can get a little ruffled when we're told what to do. Um, so it just. Ask them politely, hey, we would like to build a bridge between here and the other side of the river and, and let them come back and let IT come back with some solutions. Um, involve IT early in the process. The earlier, the better, um, because then they can be part of the process. Too many times IT is pulled in as you're about to go live and say, oh, now I need to have access to this website. I need to be able to open the firewall to be able to get through, to be able to do these things. And by by getting that related but on the late side, it may slow down the implementation of of uh, projects, as well as have patience with us. We're, we're humans just like you are, um, and and, um, uh, and and so we all are going through the same struggles with you. Um, it may seem like that because we're in a distance, um, we don't appreciate and we're not empath empathetic to your needs. We just have to follow our rules as well. Um, and and my last note here is that uh, I just wanted to thank. Um, Alex and Kathy over in Illinois, um, going through your presentation or listening to you, I can tell that we're not alone in many of the struggles that we see um, that you guys have gone through. Um, so it, it's, uh, uh, it sounds like the, the, the collaboration between IT as the, the, the technology and the business um, is an important part. And uh, as we continue this collaboration, uh, only good things can happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll go back to Jamie now. All right. Thank you, um, everyone, for those presentations. And um, I just had that can work. Um, a couple last slides, but just very briefly, um, questions. I saw a question in the chat. Um, 
acute in my chest disappeared. Um, I think it would, the question was um, for Illinois about, um, you know, you had um, IT take away the USB ports. So what do you do if you get any records or materials on USB? So that was, um, that was kind of their initial rolling out was that just everybody lost um, access. Um, but then they, there was a process that you could, um, and Alex helped us all do this so he would know better. But for example, like all of our accessions and inventory control staff, we have, we're able to, um, to, to have USB access um, in case we accession any records that are on hard drives. Um, but basically we had to, we had to get an approval from our director. Um, and we, I think we had to do like a little online training for um, security, you know, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate and what, what's, what could happen if you, um, uh, you know, stick a, or a flash drive in that you don't know anything about. Um, and, and so we were able to get that. Um, it's just that when this all started, that was right out of the gate. Um, and especially with it, we were using contractual workers. So they had like bottom of the, you know, bottom of the pole uh, security uh, capabilities. So um, Alex, any, any other words of wisdom? Uh, yeah, it's kind of as Bill mentioned with the phishing is their RIT's department or RIT department's plan is we now have a yearly electronic security uh, training that we're going to have to go through. And we had to sign a document that basically said, hey, we're aware that these are the issues. Uh, and it kind of puts some of the consequences kind of works. But if something does come out, you know, by plugging into a device that introduces some sort of virus or something, it puts a little bit of the responsibility on us, as well as our director, as well as our IT department. Uh, so it kind of, you know, just makes people a little bit more hesitant about wanting to use whatever device they're doing. Uh, and so we're in our first year, knock on wood, archives hasn't had an issue yet. Um, and we're still dealing with some of that, like with our, you know, public, uh, being able to come in, we uh, would like to have some way for them to be able to download some of the files they're looking at. Uh, and so we'll keep evolving the USB access with IT and see what we can do. All right, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Um, if not, I just want to say thank you to all of our yeah, presenters. Yeah, I, mean, I did see a, a, a question come through about selling USB oh. drives to patrons. There you go. Um, that was actually something that PHMC, I believe, does today. Uh, one of the challenges is they, they you still are giving that, PA, that, that USB drive to the patron. They're going to plug it in the computer. But, you know, I'm going to come back tomorrow and continue my research. So now I'm going to leave with that USB drive who knows what I'm gonna do with it, come back and plug it back in. So those are some of the security challenges that our folks are, are doing as well. I don't, I don't know about uh, Alex and Kathy, if, if that was an option for you guys. We've kind of talked about it, um, but I don't know if we're, if we're gonna go that route. I think we're gonna cross our fingers that we will be able to figure something else out. Um, yeah. I hear your struggle. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you to our presenters and thank you for everybody who attended and stayed a few minutes late. Um, we, uh, you will receive a very brief survey at the end um, once you log off, and we would appreciate it if you can fill it out. Um, gives us, you know, good feedback for future webinars, and here are ways to stay connected um, through our website, social media. Um, thank you all for coming, and have a great day. <laughs>